Warning, the following material is extremely disturbing. On Grave Matter, we try to be as accurate as possible and we collect information from many different sources. We don't condone or glorify murder, and we try to be as sensitive as possible to victims and their families while approaching a serious subject matter with a sense of humor. Listener discretion is advised. Maiden Voyage. The Maiden Voyage. First episode ever. Ever. And Better I'm... quality to come eventually. Yeah. If you're tuning in for the first time. This is your co-host Chris Lang as well as Jill Gentry on the other end of the other microphone. Hey. And today we're going to be talking about the Servant Girl Annihilator. So obviously it's a new podcast. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over serial killers starting with uh, local ones first so we're based out of the austin texas area and i think this is a really good choice for the first one if you haven't heard of the servant girl annihilator this is somebody that was very possibly the first serial killer in america uh there's a lot uh possibly in the world i don't know there's there's a lot of hearsay about it but it's a very interesting uh story to tell so we're gonna get cracking this guy had how many total victims jill he had eight killed and 16 total these are good numbers. These are good numbers. This makes it an interesting. Uh, this makes it an interesting show. So. Yeah, I mean, he was about he was about half successful, I guess. Hey, he was half successful. Known victim, so it's just known victim. Oh yeah. And by the way, I have some theories about that. So. And by the way, that's Jimmy Wu. He is going to be our kind of a research uh, assistant in the background. Had to happen, sorry. So you're going to hear him a few times, um, as well as as having him on the show once we can afford maybe a third microphone or something like that. Um, so yeah, so he, 16, 16 total victims, I guess you would say, eight of which he successfully killed, potentially. But there's a lot of talk about whether or not he killed them all. Um, you know, there was there was a lot of, uh, of weird stuff that happened around the situation. So the last two victims were white. Obviously, this person was in to killing servant girls, which were all uh, black at the time, of course. And um there's some inconsistencies i think in the story that we should go over so uh, but yeah his first victim this was actually what was it december 30th 1884 right you with your facts and stuff just like right out of your i head. only know the first and the last one no it's <laughs> december 30th 1884 and then the last one occurred december 24th christmas eve of 1885 so this was all basically in the span of one year um exactly and uh, some of the things that are interesting, like I said, it was uh, considered to be the first serial killer in America. Not only is it right in our backyard of Austin, Texas, but it's a very interesting story. And then also, there is a possibility that this person was Jack the Ripper, one and the same, right? So, uh, we'll talk I about don't that. think that's the case. I don't think it's a case either I'm after doing the research. After that. doing the research. But it, a lot of people, oh, yeah. it's in books. People made it a huge point that this was a possibility, in a, you know, that this was the same guy. I have my own theories. Yeah. All based on pure speculation and just. It was the cook. Exciting. No, I don't know about In that. the bedroom with a knife or a candlestick. And clue? <laughs> you know what? Honestly, um, as, we, as we talk about the police investigations further into this, you're going to realize that playing clue might have been a better way to go about the investigations <laughs> because they oh, absolutely. The uncle, uncle Daddy Sheriff wasn't. <laughs> Doing so he wasn't. He wasn't. They had absolutely no idea what to do. So let's let's talk about the victims real quick, right? Okay. We had who was the first one? The first one was Molly Smith, right? She was twenty five years old, and her boyfriend was a victim also, but he wasn't killed. He was just severely injured. Right. One Walter Spencer. Yeah, Walter Spencer. Mm -hmm. He was thirty years old. Yeah. Um. He was. He was injured. Yeah, he says that yeah. uh, Walter Spencer was seriously wounded. So that was the guy that that's showed the up. Was it boyfriend? Yeah, yeah, and that's the guy that showed up. So the way that this all unfolded, Austin had never seen anything like this before. They said that the worst that the police had seen were like high noon shootouts. This is the 1800s still, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and they would always have a suspect. They would immediately have a suspect. Oh, 
John shot Ricky out in the because Ricky's an 1880s name. Well, the whole right? town gathered to watch, so I mean, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't much of a mystery. Yeah, People exactly. hanging off I challenge you to a duel. That yeah. was the extent of their expertise. They made an appointment for this shit. They so. did. <laughs> they really did. So that was the extent of their expertise. They didn't really have a lot of uh, murder investigations. So when when the first one happened, it completely shook the community. Um, the person that responded, the police officer, um, was like, I think he was like. Just a regular, he was a regular guy. He wasn't a sergeant He's or a, a lieutenant. Deputy. Yeah, he was He was a brand new guy. And when you realize the extent of the police at the time, there was only 12 police officers in Austin, right? Yeah. So it, nobody's really experienced, you know. Um, but this guy's like third in charge. He's never investigated a murder at all. Um, and he shows up to this gruesome scene of, a, of, of Molly Smith laying in a back alley with her head almost split in half they said there was a reporter there um because they had they had found him the next found her the next morning there was a reporter there that said that the blood was so uh it was there was so much blood underneath her that it looked like she was floating in it so um they had never really seen anything like that and you know they were they had to call the sergeant over and i think people were vomiting and i can imagine probably the worst crimes they had investigated up until that point was like somebody stole bread or a horse or they said there were there were a lot of so yes there there was uh, a lot of horse thieves in the area but also there were stabbings because of card games oh, but yeah. once again you know it was johnny shot bobby or johnny stabbed bobby and everybody knew exactly who it was so it was a it was a big wake-up call for the city of austin and uh, another thing I think we should talk about is a little bit of background into the city of Austin at the time. So I've, I've seen different numbers, but the city only had a population of between, I've seen the lowest I've seen is 12,000, 11 to 12,000, and the highest I've seen is 17,500. So let's just call it 15,000 people. Uh, if you know anything about the Austin area, this is all... Um, There's slightly more people than that now, I believe. I mean... I, it's grown a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a... 17500 is now the rent charged in downtown Austin. So yeah. That's uh, kind of ridiculous. But it was such a small community that anything like this that would have happened would have, I mean, sent shockwaves through, you know, all six families that lived there, right? And all their, yeah, all their right. servants. We got a pile of the firewood in front of the door tonight. There's some shit going down. And, and that's another thing. All these people were, you know, he's, he's called the Austin Axe Murderer as well as a Servant Girl Annihilator. And he was uh, chopping people up with axes. And most of the time, the axes were belonged to the victims or to the families at least. This was, you know, the 1880s and you had piles of wood in the backyard. And the murder weapon was always left at the scene because it was just the owner's murder weapon. I already, was, I already killed this guy. I can't steal his shit, too. Right? That's messed up at that point. Especially if it's, you know, December and it's a cold winter. How are they going to chop the rest of the wood? I mean, honestly, leave it there for him at least. They need to they need to burn the body. You're going to need to... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll try and be a little more sensitive towards the Smith family. There's a few of those left, I think. There was a common misconception that there were five months of peace that went by after the first killing, you know. Uh, the first killing was so gruesome, like I said, it completely shocked everybody. And they say, oh, well, things started to calm down. And then there was another killing five months later. But people were, servant girls were being attacked throughout those five months. People were being stabbed, beaten. Um, there were uh, stories of doors rattling, you know, to the servant quarters. And people were trying to get in, even a couple times that they did get in. Okay. What blows my mind is nobody got a look at this person or these people, ever. Well, I mean, they had their heads caved in if they did well okay and he also snuck in when they were asleep but there were survivors there were the kid you know there were kids stupid kids i'm just kidding foolish children of foolish nothing. children like was it a black or a white guy what color was the person they're like i don't know <laughs> but i did <laughs> that's a tough one <laughs> but they did have uh there are a couple reports that the killer had a bag over his head oh super yeah so um they said it was a big brawny man they weren't sure if it was a uh, no Black wonder man. Austin was so about that bag ban. <laughs> oh my god. Doom. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's absolutely terrible. Um, yeah, man, it was, a, it was a tough time back then. Austin. That would have been time, scary, though. I like, just accidentally went to someone's SoundCloud. Their username is the servant girl on now later. Interesting. Nice. I guess we found him, guys. <laughs> Right? He's, he's, really he's a time traveler, right? He's a time traveler. He has a SoundCloud account. Well, let's wrap this up. We got him. 
Absolutely. Anyways, it's been a great episode. We appreciate you guys joining us. <laughs> Stamp and, uh, this bitch solved. <laughs> this guy's trying to be a rapper. Doesn't surprise me. It does not surprise me. Can you imagine those lyrics, though? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Caving in heads while they lay in the beds. <laughs> Jesus. God. Ridiculous. <laughs> so... The city of Austin. I want to talk about the city of Austin at this time, right? So the, the time's 1884 to 1885. They're in the middle of building the Capitol, which leads us to something that Jill's probably going to talk about a little bit later. So excited. <laughs> because she has her own theories so as to who did this, and it makes a lot of sense, right? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the city of Austin at the time was considered to be a shining beacon of hope, right? It was a cultural anomaly. With the UT building, Old Main was, was there. Now it's just a place I try to avoid at all costs. That's pretty much everyone except for tourists at this point and Californians, which we love. Moving on. So we had, on March 19th, 1885, Clara Strand and Christine Martinson were severely wounded, but they survived. And then we fast forward to May 6th of 1885, and Eliza Shelley was killed. Mm -hmm. She was 30 years old. Do you have any details about that? Eliza Shelley? So the Eliza Shelley killing, not too much, other than that she was a cook for the Johnson family, I believe it was. Okay. All I have written here is basic information. Name, date they died. So if you have anything... It shows where she died. Oh, I drew... I drew... I have a really cool map, actually, that I printed, and it shows... It's a modern map over Google Maps, and it shows where they all were. Well, it kind of looks like... it, It was, like, out in a rural... Versus, no. you know, like, more dense That's, parts. like, downtown, dude. Well, now it's downtown. Well, that's all there was, though, you know? But it's a very interesting map. Uh, let's let's look up. So where did we leave off? Okay, so going back to the victims here, we, we've established the first one was on West Pecan Street, and that was 25-year-old Molly Smith on December 30th of 1884. Our second victim was five months later in early May, uh, and that was Eliza Shelley, who was a cook for the Johnson family, uh, both of which were black females, right? Yes. And then that leads us to our third victim, uh, which was only two weeks later. So after this five-month gap, uh, there's another murder. And then only two weeks later is another one. And that was uh, uh, Irene Cross. And that was on May 23rd. She was the only one that was stabbed. The rest were killed with an axe. She was stabbed. Yeah. You know, you know what's interesting about the Irene Cross um, murder is that it actually took her a long time to die. It took her about 48 hours to die. And she was almost scalped completely. So... Um, as gruesome as that is, the police met with her while she was alive and tried to get information out of her as to who the assailant was, and she wasn't able to speak. So let's talk about our next victim. The next victim was Mary Ramey. Mary Ramey was um, really a wake-up call for the city of Austin, because at this point, the people of Austin were scared. Three people have already been killed, right? Uh, several people have been injured. They're they're thinking that this is a related incident. Now, the thing about Mary Ramey is she was only 11 years old. So at this point, you've got a child killed, uh, raped. And, I mean, it was, you know, absolutely gruesome. And the people of Austin are flipping out at this point. They're thinking, our leadership's no good. Uh, the police aren't going to do anything. There's only 12 people, and none of them know what they're doing. And at this point, the police during the course of their investigation, had already hired uh, an external, a third-party detective agency from Houston that came in and wound up being no good and actually kind of wound up being a fraud, uh, as well as them trying to hire the Pinkerton detectives out of Chicago, which were, like, you know, nationally famous at this point. But they actually called the wrong Pinkertons and got, like, Josh Pinkerton detective (laughs) agencies, some random guy, you know what I mean? who came down and failed as well. So the people of Austin at this point are completely fed up with the leadership. They've got a dead 11-year-old. And yeah, there's there's weird things going on. They know it's connected because people are, um, when they're reporting on this, you know, it's going all over the country and they're, they're seeing that there's like sharp metal objects being inserted into their forehead or into their ears. And it's very strange, very similar. Did they stuff. discuss what kind of sharp object? Um, no, Were they, they like didn't. Chisels so or... they it was never reported as to exactly what was in their head, only by the medical examiner. So, um, which was not even a medical examiner at the time. It was like the dude down some guy with a pocket knife. It, it literally was called the dead room of the hospital, and he was just like, "Oh, guess that happened." So, and they would he would say, you know, a hole was in the death report. It would say there was a hole 
uh, what looked to be inserted by a large metal rod. So he took the item with him? He didn't I, leave he it? He kept it. Oh. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. He, he might. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's no reports. Just long metal rod is kind of what seems to be. And I, I hear there's, you know, different types, whether it be a coat hanger or like rebar or like... Coat hanger. Yeah, stuff like I've, I've read different things, you know, so that different people had different things. I did read oh, that gotcha. Mary Ramey specifically had two metal rods inserted into her ears protruding through her eardrums. Yeah, based on my uh, That's pretty disturbing, readings, I suppose. He had, he had like a certain age group that he was harder on than others. Um, well, that's a tough age to be harder on. Right. You know? <laughs> I mean, but I don't know. Was it harder on her or did he I kill mean, her I, in one blow to the head? You know, I didn't you know? read about any sexual assaults until we got to her. There was another after that, I believe. That's but true. I didn't, you know, thinking about it now, that might have been the first one. He was escalating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... Getting more comfortable. Also, even before the very first murder, there was a lot of stuff, I guess, violent acts leading up to the first murder. And so it wasn't just all of a sudden somebody died gruesomely. There were attacks throughout the city all that summer leading up to that first murder in the winter of 84. Right? So, and it was all servant girls, uh, help around the house, and it was all very similar types of attacks. Or what would have been similar types of types of attacks if the owners didn't um, foil their plans or what have you. So, so why don't you talk about uh, after Mary Ramey. After Mary Ramey, on September 28th of 1885, um, Gracie Vance was raped and bludgeoned to death. She was 20 years old. And her boyfriend was bludgeoned to death. He was 25 years old. That was Orange Washington? Orange Washington. Which sounds like an alcoholic beverage to me. <laughs> or like an industrial cleaner. Orange Washington. Either way. Either way, you can't go wrong with those. Yeah. I would probably order an Orange Washington. Something like a dream sickle, but yeah. strong. <laughs> Wish we had one right now. Yeah, no kidding. So, okay. Uh... Sunday, September 28th of 1885, Orange Washington and his wife, Gertie Vance, Patsy Gibson, and Lucinda Body, all in the employ of court reporter editor W.B. Dunham, were attacked in their sleep. All four, four were sleeping in their shanty. Ooh, shanty. Just outside of Dunham, the Dunham residence, when a man entered with an axe and began striking them. The man then grabbed Gertie and took her to a vacant lot 75 yards from the shanty. Wow. Uh... She regained consciousness while they were there, and a struggle ensued. Um, her, her attacker quickly overpowered her, and he beat her to death with a brick. Nice guy. Wow. Um, Didn't even use the axe. Right. Lucinda Body recovered slightly from her attack and lit a lantern. The attacker saw the light from the shanty and returned in order to put out the light. Lucinda ran from the shanty only to be chased down and tackled by her assailant. She's, she's messed up by lighting a lantern, hasn't she? Yeah, that's probably not wise. Um, I would just hide or leave. Fucking Paul Revere over here. Yeah. <laughs> the murderer's coming. The murderer's coming. <laughs> that's fantastic. This, the we'll two be, struggled briefly. <laughs> we'll be here all week. Yeah. Well, once a week. Okay, so he killed her with a brick. Yeah, and then the other chick turned on the lights and totally... <laughs> once again. Once again, you need to learn from your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, they struggled briefly or were halted by Mr. Dunham, who had been awoken by the commotion. Right. Upon seeing her employer, she ran to him screaming, and the attacker fled into the night. And that's common. I've, I've, I've read and through the videos that I've watched that a lot of times the owner would come out. And that's why there's eight murders and 16 injuries, because a lot of the times they would scream for their owners, and the owner would come out. It seemed like the person was always afraid of the, of, of, of the, the masters or the owners at that time. Was it slavery? I don't think so. About slavery? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, it was just... Because they called them employers. Okay. And they were paid, I believe. Okay, I don't want to say, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, employers. Yeah. Um, the neighbors tried to search for him. Good employers, they... especially since they had their own shanty. Yeah. Yeah, what, what a generous guy there. Yeah. Um, like, I can't even picture what a shanty would be because that's totally, like, lower than a cabin. We're in one. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Basically. Touche. Look, bitch, we have a door. Don't be talking shit. <laughs> There's no knob on it. <laughs> I'm going to show you a knob. All right. That sounded dickish. I know. 
Scientific-ish. Orange Washington died the next day. Lucinda and Pat- Patsy both recovered from their wounds. Man. Um, public outrage began to surface when Eula Phillips and Susan Hancock were murdered. 17-year-old... Yes, yes. Eula Phillips was known to be a beautiful woman, and the paper described her as beautifully one, frail. One of the most beautiful girls in Austin, both occurred on the same night. Both women were white. So this opens up a whole new world of possibilities, right? Because at the time, everyone thought, oh, it's a black gang. Uh, there were rumors that it was a group of uh, religious black people that thought that these servant women were being unfaithful to their husbands and they wanted to set things straight. Um, and now there's two white people that are dead. And obviously, with the time frame that we're looking at here, the public started paying a lot more attention once white people were killed, right? Yeah. Uh... But they were the last murders, so that opens up a lot of questions. You know what I mean? Was it because the public became so involved that it was no longer viable to mm-hmm. kill people? I think it was just because he had gotten more, uh, he got more confident. A little more ballsy. Yeah, more I mean... And probably in his mind, he was or, like, they're not going to be looking for me if I just kill black people. You know, and then, yes, Chris? My hand was raised for our listeners. Um, so, an interesting story about Eula Phillips specifically. What was her her husband, James? James Phillips? Um, I think it was James Phillips. James Phillips, correct. Yeah. So, James Phillips and Eula Phillips had a very interesting relationship. Um, they were kind of hooked up when they were younger. James got her pregnant, and they say it was a marriage of necessity, meaning that... Tale is old as time. Exactly. <laughs> right. It, yeah. Right? So that's apparently what happened there. And apparently they didn't have a great relationship. You know, neighbors and friends reported on it, that he was abusive and she was extremely unhappy. And so in my mind, I think to myself, what if he killed her? And I mean, with an axe and was like, oh, it must have been that servant girl annihilator. I think it would be a little bit hard to beat yourself with an axe. Why? Because he was, well, I mean, different than shooting yourself. Can you, could you bludgeon yourself to a point of not death, but just yeah, enough? Yeah, I almost did that with a shovel ten minutes ago. <laughs> not on purpose. Well, if I wanted to kill my significant other, I might have done it on purpose. I mean, wouldn't okay, wouldn't it be a perfect cover? To hit yourself, hey, hey, Jimmy, hit me with a shovel a couple times so I don't look guilty. You know what I mean? He's like, all right, dude, like you're fucking weird, but I, I don't know because there's four of them at the time. There was a whole chase, foot, foot chase, and look, Jill, don't come at me. With the your facts, fucking <laughs> logic and shit. I know, right? All right, so we've talked about our victims, right, from right. Molly Smith down to Eula Phillips. Let's talk a little bit about how. The people of Austin and the police investigated this slash handled this because the people of the town were extremely involved at the time, right? There wasn't... um, Well, they were certainly pissed off anyway. I'll say that, yeah. They were definitely pissed off. And there wasn't exactly a professional police force at the time, right? So let's say we had 15,000 people in the city at the time. We had 12 cops. It was like, who's going to handle this one? Jimmy, Donnie, or Bobby, you know? And the sergeant, who was the hardcore, the most experienced one, which I, I haven't found any specific information about uh, the way that he looked other than that he was a massive man that was extremely intimidating. So I'm picturing a guy that's like 6'6", like John Wayne type hardcore cowboy that everyone respected, right? Hmm. He was the sergeant of the police force and he had uh, bloodhounds that were considered to be the pure brain. the ultimate in you know CSI technology at the time um, however we'll, we'll we'll just say that his bloodhound and they never worked they never picked up a trail and there is a theory that the reason that the blood that dog hunt, don't hunt basically. well either he was sold a bad bloodhound or they said that the blood was so significant that it overwhelmed the dog so, the the dog wasn't able to handle it. Try smacking it on the head like a TV. It works with frog. <laughs> I want to talk about his. Um, I want to talk about the killer's physical attributes right. and what they expected he looked like. And of course, they assumed immediately he was uh, a black guy. And the possible suspects. So the 
there were some descriptions of him based on quote unquote eyewitness accounts that said they basically descri- described him as like John Coffey with a toe missing on his right foot. Right. So, and I've heard different things. I've heard that there is the John Coffee guy, just a massive black man that is running around killing people, always barefoot. Did you With get that? With his pants in rolled your up. Right, yeah. yeah. With either a missing toe or a club foot or both. Right? Yeah. I've heard all three. So I've, I've mostly seen missing toe. Okay. They don't go into details about which toe, though. I, I saw pinky toe. I couldn't believe it would be a big toe. That would throw off his balance and he would right. not how be could so he, good. How could anybody swing an axe with missing a big toe? I mean, if you think could, about the physics of the situation. That goes into my whole theory about how he lost the toe. Yeah. No, and that's great. So, And we'll touch on that here in a minute, guys. Because I honestly, I think that Jill has a really good theory as to what actually happened. Because there's all this... Um, stuff about oops the, the ceiling fell down <laughs> just kidding there's all this talk about Jack the Ripper and these and I don't know if it's people trying to get YouTube views or what I, there is something that kind of makes sense with Jack the Ripper but from the eyewitness descriptions I don't think it's possible at all I think your theory makes way more sense than anything I've heard so far yeah and I the re- there's a lot of reasons I don't think it was Jack the Ripper uh, one one of the reasons is Jack the Ripper's murders were done with precision. They were said they were to be done by a surgeon. Um, <laughs> this guy sucked at murder, okay? He was really bad. Well, I mean, there's a big difference between beating the hell out of somebody with an axe to, their head to dissecting somebody and removing organs without... Maybe he got better. I mean, I doubt <laughs> maybe, it. Maybe, maybe he was a medical student that practiced, you know what I mean? I mean, this guy went around barefooted, so that leads me to believe he didn't have quite the funds it would take to make it all the way to England on his own. I mean... Unless he took his shoes off. What did they wear? What kind of shoes did they have back then? I don't even know. Cowboy boots? Clogs, fool. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Doc Martens, obviously. Just a piece of old leather and paper wrapped around He probably just threw his Tims in the closet and went ahead and, you know... Chuck Taylors? Because Chuck Taylors... Made and out of pig's ears. The, the guy's name was Chuck Taylor, all right? Look, he didn't have any shoes. He committed all these murders. He had to cover up his footprints, and he invented this cheap canvas footprint that basically hit him. But we kept finding this strange star print at every crime scene. <laughs> it was so weird. It said all-star. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he was a basketball player. No, but okay, so uh, I think your theory is, is great, but let's talk a little bit more about the police investigations because I thought that it was... Uh, extremely interesting in the fact that they were so incompetent and I don't mean to be rude but as I was researching uh, this this case um, right before this all took place like I said there were only 12 guys on the police force and they had 13 prisoners in the jail that all escaped right before this all happened yeah, it's highfalutin police work there I mean really and you sorry know, we couldn't afford a rope for the door <laughs> I mean, really, what, what goes, how do you, you had one job. That's the beginning of that joke. I mean, really, you had one job. And, yeah, all 13 got away. Um, <laughs> at the time, the police force thought that this was uh, gang violence or there were multiple assailants involved. Um, they rounded up hundreds, I believe, about 200 black people in the community and questioned them all very mm-hmm. intensely using... Um, there was a very specific method, and it was basically waterboarding, what we call, you know, torture nowadays, but they called it uh, examinations. They called them examinations, and they would whip people and threaten them with lynching and say, we're going to lynch your family. I mean, extremely tough stuff. And never once did these any of these suspects flinch or say that they did anything. Not when it was, Absolutely, it was not me. Um, now let's take a look at that right foot. <laughs> yeah, right? You know what I mean? And they did. They did. They actually had people compare footprints, even down to the the white boyfriend or husband of Eula Phillips, James Phillips. They even had um, a footprint of his brought into the courtroom because he was arrested and I believe charged, but then later released. So uh, they did. They looked at all of that and they, they, they were never able to find a specific suspect, right? So they brought in other bloodhounds because they didn't really know what they were doing. They brought in Pinkerton detectives, both the real ones and the fake one on accident. They brought in uh, detectives, PIs from Houston. Uh, Everybody failed, right? The public became absolutely outraged. They fired the city marshal 
H. Grooms Lee and replaced him with James Lucy, who was a former Texas Ranger. So everyone was extremely uncomfortable. They basically were like, if if we don't have Chuck Norris, <laughs> we're completely out of luck here. So they hired Chuck Norris, who also failed. Um, and then they started kind of speculating because ultimately it ended before they got anywhere, right? Um at the time, by the way, I, I want this to be understood, the Pinkerton detectives of Chicago were nationally renowned and they were basically um, kind of like a, like almost like a, like a Blackwater or some type of, there was nobody better. This was the Navy SEALs of the time. So like know? an elite group. An of... elite, yeah, absolutely. An elite group of SAS, Navy SEALs. By the way, I'm a former Marine, so I make a lot of military references, but they. Uh, yeah. I am not, so I will not. <laughs> Carry on. What you... <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> Anyways, that's Jill and her comedy. So, um, the police were absolutely lost. Uh, everybody failed, but let's talk about some of the possible suspects that they considered. One of them, uh, and this is one of the strongest suspects, I believe, was Nathan Elgin, right? Or Elgin, like the city that's right near Austin. There's an Elgin in Illinois, I believe. Elgin. It's, yeah, it's fan. Okay. So. Not relevant, but still interesting. <laughs> Yo, Abraham, that guy was a governor of Louisiana. I swear to God. We'll cut that out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Nathan Elgin, who is one of the suspects. I believe was, um, I want to say, the closest to being correct. I think your theory is probably more on point than anything I've ever heard. But let's talk about Nathan for a second. So this guy was a large black man. He was only 19 years old. Um, he had a club foot and... A missing toe. Um, he was killed while assaulting somebody. Oh shit! Yeah. And then the murders stopped. Okay, so mm, kind of lines up a little bit there, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Especially with how old was he? Did it say he was only nineteen? Okay. Yeah. And so that sounds like it's something that is, is very possible. I mean, it sounds like a, enough of a reason for them to stop looking for the guy. Right. And then there's two big theories behind the Jack the Ripper connection, right? So um, one theory is that there was a Malay cook, right? Um, he, his name was Maurice, or at least that's what he called himself. And he worked at a small hotel in Austin in 1885. He quit towards the end of the murders with plans of moving to London. Right. So there's a lot of that's pretty much the only speculation tying okay. Jack the Ripper to the murders in Austin because Jack the Ripper was a very precision killer, as you said, right? Yeah. Almost medical with it. And then some of the uh, killings in the Servant Girl Annihilator case had, like we said, the sharp ob objects inserted into their head, their forehead, into their ears. It was almost always into their head. So that's kind of the connection between the medical precision of Jack the Ripper and the killer here. Uh, Jack, However, those killings happened three years after. The three years later, 1888. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So th that's one theory. Another theory is that there was a gentleman, and this is a Jack the Ripper theory, that there was a gentleman by the name of James Maybrook who could have been Jack the Ripper. And Jack the Ripper, um, as James Maybrook, I should say, was introduced as a well-to-do white male, handlebar mustache, top hat, kind of portly, if you can get the idea Guilty, there. mustache, always. Got him. H.H. H. Holmes, motherfucker. <laughs> well, we, which we will all also talk about H.H. H. Holmes and his Chicago Hotel of uh, Killing Treachery, which was very clever, oh, right, architecturally right. kind of incredible. But anyways, um, so yeah, so James Maybrook was very possibly Jack the Ripper and worked at a very prominent business facility uh, in London and apparently traveled to Austin several times during the killings uh, for... Guilty, Profession. mustache or not. Must <laughs> because he has the handlebar mustache and a top hat, all he needs is a fucking monocle. <laughs> it's game a over. Cape. <laughs> he owns everything. I don't know. I cape. can't even get fucking Baltic Avenue. A cape and a pimp cane. Those are the two things missing. I mean, seriously, you're not kidding. So, that's James Maybrook. Because like, I think I'll dress as a serial killer today. <laughs> I think I like this look. This is, this is working out pretty well this for me, guys. how you let your wardrobe decide your career. I mean, seriously. You never know. There's there's so many theories around this that's just kind of um, 
eye-opening, if you will, and it really makes you think as, as to what happened. And it's such a it's such a strong case to look at because this is possibly the first serial killer in America, possibly Jack the Ripper. It's in our own backyard. I mean, the theories are, are, are I don't want to say endless, but there's multiple theories, right? It's so weird to think about the locations of the killings and where the bodies were found versus what Austin looks like today. Like a body was yeah. found where the Four Seasons is, and a body was found where the Austin Library. Is. Oh, and some of these some of these locations are absolutely incredible. So I, I what I did is I, I used a map of Austin in 1884, which you can find online, but just by googling it, there was only one map. I forgot the gentleman's name who made it, but there was only one map. And I looked at that, and I saw some of the side streets and some of the locations, some of the uh, landmarks, if you will, and I made a map of where the killings took place in t on Google Maps in Austin in today's term. And uh, what you find is that this was all within seven, eight blocks of each other. I mean, it was all extremely... Um, within nine-toe walking distance. Within nine-toe walking distance, Nathan, Elgin, Jin, however you say it. So... Um, you know, it all it all happened in a very close knit quarters in what is modern downtown Austin, just a few blocks from the Capitol. So you have locations that are like um, um, the Chive headquarters. If you've ever heard of the Chive, which is absolutely incredible. Um, what's the gentleman? The Steakhouse. What's his name? Vince Young. Vince Young Steakhouse is is actually one of the sites. And Vince Young is a famous football player, if you don't know. And that's that's right across. That's pretty, that's like a block away from uh, the Driscoll Hotel. Yeah, the Driscoll Hotel was there at the time. And this was blocks. Yeah, just a few blocks. And there was also a killing that was just a block away from that. So it was later. It wasn't the next killing or the previous killing, but I think it was two killings later. There was a, a murder a block away from that. There was also a very famous beer garden that a murder uh, took place next to. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but... Um, you know, now it, it, one one of them was right by the library where, where we researched all of this. You know, it was uh, I think just a block away from the the Austin Public Library downtown. So it's 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 kind of uh, important to us, and it's very cool that all of this took place in our backyard, and it's such a historical interest uh, for us. You know, if you will. But what I what I'd like to talk about next a little bit is your personal theories, Jill, because we've talked about who the victims were. We've talked about where it took place and some of the theories that surround this. So I think what I'd like to talk about is uh, maybe some of your theories into this and maybe a few questions that we can follow up with that I've, I've kind of come up with during this whole process of research. So uh, with without further ado, let's give us some insight into your private investigation firm, Ms. Gentry. I just kind of have these theories about mm -hmm. who this guy was, where he came from, things like that. Right. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I added to it, the more, the more it made sense to me. And the more it made sense to me too, because I, I, you know, I really bought into the whole. Oh, this could be. We could get more viewers because this guy could be Jack the Ripper. I mean, honestly, I was kind of looking into the business mindset, but the way that you've explained it to me and, and and brought about this theory makes me pretty excited that we might have actually found the right guy, or the right idea. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so, based on what I've what I've read, is that during these murders was the year that they began building the Driscoll Hotel and the Austin the Capitol. Capitol building. Yeah, exactly. And um, I thought maybe this guy could have been somebody that was traveling through, passing through, looking for work, um, maybe traveling along the railway. Mm -hmm. um, I looked up who built these buildings um which are two of what the capital the capital the, okay. building and the driscoll which are arguably two of the biggest landmarks in downtown austin still today yeah absolutely yeah. um those that those that don't know and i don't mean to interrupt but those that don't know the driscoll hotel is a very famous and old hotel considered to be haunted in downtown austin right off of sixth street it's absolutely famous and it's absolutely beautiful but yeah and i'm not real sure of the distance, but it's it's less than a mile, probably ha less than half a mile from the Capitol building, right? I yeah, think. no, absolutely. And also, um, one of the killings took place basically across the street, you know, like a block away. So right. It's and, and also a block away from the old main building at UT. So, but anyways, yeah, go ahead. So I was thinking, um, 
I looked up who would have been working on these particular buildings, who who the, who would have built these buildings at the time. Right. And according to what I found in my research, um, basically these buildings were erected by there was obviously an architect in charge and and whatnot, but they were the basic manpower and grunt work was done by thousands of migrant workers and ex-convicts uh, traveling Convicts. through town looking for work. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, well, there's your first clue, Sherlock. There you go. Um, and so I started thinking about what would have been involved in the erection of these buildings. And so I started looking into uh, the rail the railroad. And throughout the, the building, the building of the Driscoll and the Capitol building, uh, they were working on the railroads also. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point yeah. towards the end of the carpentry work, which I figure most of the uh, carpentry work, woodwork would have been done in the beginning of the projects. I mean, they started bringing right. in marble yeah. from Granite Shoals, Marble Falls on the railroad. Cedar Park, and they had the red granite, which yeah. is iconic of the capital. Cedar Park is kind of close to where we live, to our uh, new listeners out there, which is really about... You know, 30 minutes northwest Austin, which is kind of where we're based out of. So I've seen this stuff, and I've seen the railroad, and I've seen the plaques that are out there talking about the commemoration of, of building the Capitol. And I think it's it makes so much sense that this could, is a possibility, right? Right. So a migrant worker, ex-convict. Yeah, and then I started looking into um, what a common carpentry tool kit would be um, for that time. Right. And it basically consists of... Like a hacksaw, um, a couple chisels, and Any axes? about five or six different kinds of hand axes. No kidding. Um, so there might have been dozens of men walking around town just carrying bags of axes. Um, okay, but let me ask you this. Most of the axes that were used... Were taken from the families that were... Right. Yeah, mm. right. But You wouldn't want to use your own axe. I mean, you got to use that for work. Right. But well, certainly somebody who knew how to use one. Correct. But maybe not so well, considering he was missing a toe on his right foot. He's practicing. Dun, dun, dun. Like dun, that. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, I'm sure people were missing all kinds of body parts back then, but I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just picture a Seriously. guy swinging an axe and being like, oh, shit, my paper fucking shoe didn't hold up so well. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Like, uh, no, absolutely. They didn't have steel toe boots back then. Um and yeah, I figured, they, used you know, to, they used to use wooden shoes. Clogs. They did have fucking clogs, apparently. <laughs> That's amazing. Jill was like, yeah, they just had fucking clogs. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see their tap dancing recital at the end of their projects, their construction projects. You never know. You great. never know. And they might have. Yeah. They were very celebratory back then. Well, I started thinking, if they're doing the, if they're doing the woodwork and carpentry type shit at the beginning of, of these, you know, the framework and, and, and staircases, whatever, you know. Right. Um... That might line up with the killings. You know, once work dried up, he didn't have a reason to stick around. He got back on the train and took off, you know? Yeah. You know, what's funny about that is there was, um, and I don't remember the exact victim, but I think it was one of the last ones, one of the survivors of the last one stated that, um, oh, no, you know what it was? It was the lady that was killed with her two children, Eliza Shelley, possibly. I think it was Eliza Shelley was killed and her two children were spared. And the two children said that um, the killer, one of the children had said that the killer had spoke to them and said that they were uh, boarding a train to St. Louis the next day. So that is, you know, hmm. kind of lines up with the railroad theory. But at the same time, I guess he hung around for a few more months. And why would he tell a child where he's actually going? Unless this person is actually insane, which kind of fits the description. Right. Based on the uh, eight murders. <laughs> I figure maybe he could have, um, after that point when the murder stopped, he could have moved on to a, a rural area where, okay. you know, Austin wouldn't be keeping up with what's going on in Elgin or... You know what would be Bastrop, interesting? You know? And this goes out to our listeners, too. And is, as I know we don't have a lot right now, and as we gain listeners, this might be something that you guys can touch on. But if, if anybody has any information on any killings that are similar to this with sharp instruments being inserted into people's ears or their head or things like that. It'd be interesting to know about. Say, oh, Kansas City, 1886, this happened. You know, we'd be like, oh, man. I've got a couple of those. Maybe make some connections. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, if he didn't move on to another community, uh, he could have died or been arrested for another, you know, another crime. In Especially another city if state. it was Nathan Elgin. Right, exactly. Um, I just figure, you know, if he would have been in the prime age of doing this hard labor work, he probably would have been somewhere between 22 years old and maybe 35 years old, something like right. that. Mm-hmm. Um, police precincts didn't really communicate with each other like they do now. No, so, not at all. Absolutely so he could have moved, not. He could have moved 60 miles away. And there was absolutely zero communication between cities, I mean, other than the news reports, right? So you had... The New York Times reported on this. Um, the Austin Statesman, the San Antonio Express had a... Um, had a guy up here. Uh, a guy came up so from San Antonio. So what were you doing in December of... Where were you on the night of December 24th, 1885? Oh, Jimmy. I wasn't born, man. My dad lost that. <laughs> That's Your dad wasn't born yet. Your dad's dad died. Oh, wait, oh, wait, okay. This is a, li- a likely a That's likely. like a minute story. ago, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to this. He was in his dad's ball sack. Okay. That'll do it. This is turning into Howard Stern real fast. I was going to say... God, how I love talking about genitalia. So, what really blew my freaking mind hole was I was thinking, you know, I was I was wondering if I could find other reports about other unsolved axe murders along the railroad. Right. No, that and makes total sense, yeah. The, what is it? The Southern Pacific Railroad goes all across the bottom of the country. Well, yeah, that's tough to... I didn't look into the routes that the trains took from Austin. I know they went up north. Well, all I can tell you is that there are several hundred unsolved axe murders during that time along the railroads. Really? Yes. Okay. So real quick, let me ask you about the timeline that this took place. Where, where did, As far as the railroad murders, is it possible that the same person committed all 100 of these uh, within the time frame that we're talking about? Well... There are several unsolved axe murders along the railroads, even all the way up north. Um, some of them are a long shot. Some of them probably aren't the same guy, obviously. And there are right. there are a few famous, really famous ones, like the Velisca House murders. Yeah. The Velisca axe murders. The Velisca axe murders. Right? Um, the mulatto murders, which I don't think that's involved. It just seems too specific to me hmm. uh, because they were, basically whoever this was, was killing mixed race families. Um, right. Especially and, and, because of Molly Smith being so light-skinned. And entire families at that. Mm-hmm. Five, six people at a time. Um, but basically... That's the only connection. Right. Yeah. The timeline that I looked into was 1885 to uh, 1919. Okay. Um, and what really got me kind of excited and thinking about this and just, you know, speculating and and all that was that um, the Axe Man of New Orleans was active from May of 1918 to October of 1919. Hmm. I couldn't find any information on any suspect they may have had, but anytime I've ever seen him portrayed in movies or TV, you know, TV shows, things like that, he's always like, They always describe him as a distinguished older gentleman. It might have had something to do with the fact that he was so into jazz music or or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But the people that they've gotten to play this part have always been older men, 58 years old to 66 years old, Mm -hmm. somewhere in that area. Um, Now, if our guy was in prime hard labor condition when he was working in Austin in 1885, and then... He was also this this guy that was responsible for these murders. He would have been around that age when those murders take place. Where did they take place at? Uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Mm. Um, it was there were some similarities okay. to the the, the modus operandi. Yeah, operandi. Mm-hmm. Whatever the mo. The mo. The mo. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. I think me and Jill were talking about this. How like maybe you know the servant girl killers were just like the beginning of his, like, early stages of him, like, fine-tuning his M.O. and getting more into like, it. Like, maybe maybe the first one in Austin was actually his first murder. Maybe he was started right. sloppy and got more... I mean, he could have started in New Mexico, for all we know, when he was 19 years old or yeah. 22 years old. But, I mean, what really got me thinking about this was there could have been so many things. He could have been responsible for a lot in between that. 
You know, there was two or three here, two or three there throughout the country. Right. Or failed attempts. Right, or failed attempts. A lot of these people were beaten. He only had Or stabbings. He stabbed yeah. one victim in Austin, so... Right. Yeah, and you know, if you think about stabbings and an axe, it's kind of similar. Yeah. You're, um, you're chopping people up either way, whether you're Chef Ramsay or a woodsman, you know? Right. <laughs> I guess, let me add, there could be a possibility where that, that like, stabbing is just one-off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so... Or that it intensified, you know? There could have been, if you could have been active all those years, or what really got me started to think about it was um, when they caught the Golden State Killer last year. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, yeah, the old guy. Right, yeah. because he he was active in his early 20s, late 20s, and then I believe his late 20s. As soon as his kids were born, he stopped. He ceased all crime. Hmm. He um, After his kids grew up, he was too old to go back to what he was doing, you know, breaking yeah. into houses and killing people. Um, but he was slowly <laughs> edging his people. way back into, like, petty crimes and, like, um, even as old as he was, he was mm-hmm. still doing things like trying to intimidate women, children, um, spying, peeping Tom type activity. Um, <laughs> I just think of so many funny, like Saturday night live skits that could come out of that. Just like an old man falls out of a tree, peeping Tom, <laughs> fuck, I'm just like, stuck on the ground. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I was just thinking like if this guy <laughs> hits his fucking life alert bracelet, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if this guy started out in Austin. And then say he was in his early 20s. Okay. He moved on to the next place, killed another couple of people, and then he met somebody and he got married and he had children. And then after his children moved on to their own Continued. lives, he moved on to Louisiana and started, you know, or, yeah. you know. Because I think that that whatever's inside of that killer, and this is, you know, maybe something we'll dive into in future episodes is more of the psychology of how these people operate. But I, f- I feel like that's not something you're ever going to get rid of. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen Mr. Brooks? What a cool, yeah, yeah. What a cool movie, right? Yeah, it like, is. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of different psychology stuff that mm-hmm. you know, nature versus nurture, um, yeah. childhood experiences, head injuries, and in, in right. people, you know. Uh, what? That's the next section. There's all different kinds of. You what know, caused this person to be like that? What would cause somebody to be America's first serial killer? I mean, it could be yeah. anything mental, emotional abuse. Um, or illnesses, or especially with such a, you know, psychopathy. He's not or... right there. It, it, he's this guy's America's first serial killer. Potentially, yeah. Really? Yeah. What was the first one like in history? No, I don't know. Jack the Ripper? Or I guess no, this was Jack the Ripper was three years after this guy. Oh wow! And so this possibly guy had the three same. years over Jack the Ripper. Yes, yeah, so this was eighteen eighty four to eighteen eighty five. Jack the Ripper took place in eighteen eighty eight. And it's very possible that it was the same person. Dude, we got... I mean, that would be cool if we can find some, like, older serial killers later on. Yeah, like. and maybe that's... And, and maybe that's something that we can look into is, is, you know, seeing who... And maybe my research guy can jump on it. <laughs> seeing who would be um, some of the first serial killers reported. And... It's not that murders didn't take place before this. It's just that there were no... H.H. H. Holmes. 1861 to 1896. Okay. So... Okay, so America's for serial killers out the window. Yeah, I mean, people have been killing people since people have existed. So America's first serial killer... Probably it's, nobody even knows who he is. Yeah, but it's it's always promoted like that when, you, when I looked at, you know... Um, uh, books written or articles written, it always seemed like it was, oh, America's first serial killer, terror in the capital city, or, you know, something. I don't know. Maybe they're just trying to sell stuff. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's just, you know. Ultimately, I mean, I think, you know, because we're nearing the end of the episode here, just kind of to wrap everything up, and uh, we'll do like a quick uh, exit overview of the whole situation. I mean, obviously, we've debunked that, I guess. H.H. H. Holmes uh, uh, is, is winner, winner, chicken dinner on that one. So, um uh, this this guy, uh, whoever he was, uh, you know, ultimately killed eight people in a short time period, only one year. You know, a lot of these people are you're going to see up 13 years before they're even caught, stuff like that. It was only one year, almost exactly one year. Um, so um, 16 people were injured. He killed eight of them, and he was basically never found. There's tons of crazy theories that surround this uh, story. I would encourage you guys to go out and, and Google some stuff and look it up and... Um, 
ultimately, we appreciate you guys uh, sitting through and listening. Like, uh, our, our show is going to be more fact oriented and uh, kind of go through some of the more gruesome details of what actually happened and a little BS sprinkled in on top of it. So, <laughs> we're going to work, we're going to work on the uh, fine tuning of things. And- yeah, yeah, absolutely. Better quality to come for sure. This, this is definitely going to be the roughest episode. So, please uh, hang in there with us. And um, we appreciate you guys so much. Please check us out on social media. Uh, We're on Facebook at the Grave Matter Podcast as well as Instagram at the same thing. Um, uh, We're getting a Twitter soon. uh, So if people want to reach out to us or whatever, we can can, can chat. As well as uh, working on a website and getting our RSS feed up so you guys can download us uh, on Apple and Google. And uh, we should have it up in a a few other places as well. Um, And we'll keep you updated on that. But we appreciate it very much and we'll see you next week. I also want to thank everybody who's shared all of our posts and yes. all the support we've gotten on Facebook. We haven't even released this episode yet, and we were already into the... Tens of thousands. Yeah, people were yeah. just checking out the page, so I mean, that's huge. Yeah, not likes, not likes. I'm not lying, but uh, we just started like two weeks ago, but we've already reached 15,000, 16,000 people, and it's really cool to uh, see that people are interested in this. Thanks a lot, guys. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. See you next week, guys.